It's about time before this upcoming season that I put together a video that's going to make a bunch of you dyed in the wool, hardcore elk hunters, focused on elk hunting, that's your goal, make you guys cry a little bit. Because I'm going to talk about the inadvertent propaganda there is around elk hunting in the western states, Colorado, Idaho, Wyoming, Montana. There is this infatuation with that species and I get it. My whole career in the outdoor space was developed around elk hunting. So I understand this infatuation, but every season it gets worse and worse and I interact with so many hunters now, right? I get so many questions, particularly from new guys. So I'm going to talk about that whole dynamic today. I'm going to shit on elk hunting a little bit. I'm going to give you some alternatives, but I'm going to explain along the way, right? All right, so this made up term, inadvertent propaganda. So here's the deal. You got to understand the dynamic in the hunting space, right? The Western hunting space. Elk hunting is the money maker. That used to be the case just in the outfitting guided world, right? Elk hunting is where outfitters and guides make their money in terms of Western hunting. No doubt about it. That is the cash cow. But what has happened in the last decade to 15 years, that cash cow has trickled down to being the cash cow for the gear industry, for the supplement industry, which is like kind of fucking hilarious to me. But even that, right? The supplement business, the motivation business, elk hunting is like the cash cow, right? That's what we're all focused on. And there's a bunch of historical reasons why that is. Really, it's entrenched in the species as a whole, right? It's a very adaptable species. Over the years, particularly the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, it was managed for opportunity in Colorado. There's tons of predator suppression. We could get into this for, for ages, but it was the one species that could consistently support a ton of harvest and a ton of people out there pursuing them. And then of course, elk take you into magical country. And an added bonus is they're one of the best game meats out there, right? So all of that combined makes them kind of the, you know, not really like the, the top of the hierarchy by any means, but more like the one that everybody can do, the, you know, in terms of Americans, it is like the Western big game hunt that everybody wants to do. And that has been commercialized and monetized from the state game departments to the outfitters and guides to the gear world. Go check out my video. I'll stick a link up right here that talks about the hunting industry. I touch on that in depth, all of that stuff. Elk is the epitome of that. It's what moves the needle, right? All the guys trying to sell you shit, they have latched on to elk as a species, right? And so just from a marketing standpoint, you know, like a macro marketing standpoint in terms of species, all of you guys, particularly newer hunters, all you've ever heard about is elk hunting. So when you think about going to the mountains, that's what you consider to be, you know, like your only option, or that's the only option that anybody respects, or that's the hunt that you have to do. And it's total, total bullshit. So let's just bang through the cons of elk hunts out west, get that over right here at the starting blocks. One, the cost, right? So the cost of the tags, your direct cost. And this whole video is gonna be in the context of do-it-yourself hunting, but the guided world parallels it, right? The same reasons that guided hunts are more expensive for certain species are, is pretty much correlated to why a do-it-yourself hunt is, is more expensive too. But let's just focus on the context of do-it-yourself hunt. So cost. Your elk tags in all the states, including Colorado, are gonna be more than all your other species. Not the specialty species like moose, goat, and sheep, but all your other species like deer, antelope, bears, those are gonna be significantly less. I mean, well, I can pull up Colorado right here on my computer. I mean, you're talking about a non-resident elk tag is now, what is it? A non-resident bull tag in Colorado is $760. A non-resident deer tag is, $460, so $300 difference right there. That's your fuel if you're driving across country to get there, right? Just the tag difference right there. And then if you drop down to a bear hunt, which I'm gonna talk about that a lot, just because that's like the one to go on. That's the secret in mountain hunting right now is spring bear hunts and fall bear hunts are where it's at in terms of the value. And I'm not talking about just experience and all that. I'm talking about even becoming a better elk hunter, but I'm getting ahead of myself here. So uh, a bear tag in Colorado, let's look here, is 115 bucks. And if you look at Idaho for spring tags, in a lot of those units that the tags are readily available, you can get like the second, I don't know what it is, but it's like the second class tag. It's like the units where they want you to kill bears. Um, I mean, you can get the tag, I think it's less than $50. So on the tag front, elk way outpace these other opportunities. And then on your gear front, your logistics, let's like loop all that together. Backpack elk hunts are the most expensive. The reality is if you want to go on a backpack elk hunt, and this is again, like even within the elk hunting world, and, I, and like, I feel like I'm shitting on my own world here, but even within the elk hunting world and that focus on elk hunts out West, there's even another niche 
the archery elk hunts, right? So if we go into the archery elk hunts and the backpack archery elk hunts, right? Like now we're niching down. That's really where the cool shit is, right? In terms of all the marketing out there. And they are fun hunts. But I'm going to take a little of the pizzazz out of them here in the next five, ten minutes. But anyways, that little internal niche to elk hunting, that is where the cost of your gear skyrockets, right? All the ultralight stuff is super expensive. You've got to get just more gear. You actually, typically, if you want to hunt good areas, you got to have a well-equipped vehicle. A lot of stuff goes into that type of hunt whereas some of these other hunts I'm going to talk about later in this video you don't have to have any of that like you could literally do some of these hunts just hiking off a highway from a rental car there's kind of a reason for that it's like a self-fulfilling circle right like we're all talking about these type of hunts they are badass hunts but at the same time we're like all optimizing for them and that that just creates a bigger gear industry feeding that optimization right and then that gets more and more marketing around elk hunting and that becomes the dominant hunt and again getting ahead of myself and so let me stop right here because the things i've talked about are actually only relevant to a segment of you right and, and and i think that's important to acknowledge and be honest about if you've got a lot of time on your hands you enjoy the gear thing you've got a lot of a lot of disposable income and you've come into this with the elk hunting goal ignore everything i just said it's not really relevant to you, so just take it for what it's worth, let's move on. For everybody else, that's the super relevant to you relative to these other opportunities I'm gonna talk about. So, let's talk about the experience of elk hunting. This is, this is, this one's gonna make my head hurt. There's like so much bullshit around this one. Let me take you in the other room and uh, get a little fresh air and we'll talk about it. When it comes to elk hunting, we're thinking about like nostalgic elk hunting, right? Like we're backpacking in to wilderness areas in Colorado that are untouched. We're taking horses in, we're doing just cool stuff, going up to Timberline, all of that. And we associate that with elk hunting, again, through all this marketing, all this inadvertent propaganda I talk about, but you can get that through other hunts. I have killed bears in wilderness areas. I've killed mule deer in wilderness areas. There's a lot of overlap in habitat. And so you can get that same experience in these hunts I'm gonna talk about, but people tend to associate that only with elk hunting because that's what you see in all the pictures. That's what you see in all the marketing. That's what you hear all the supplement guys talk about. All this crazy shit kind of promotes that elk hunting is the only hunt that's gonna take you into the backcountry, gonna take you into the wilderness, gonna show you timberline, show you the beauty of those places totally untrue and the thing that's interesting is you see this in other species too there's this obsession with sheep hunting and i don't really want to get dive super deep in it but sheep hunting is a scarce thing right there's just not that many tags it kind of takes the inverse spot that elk have taken historically they're just a species that's not that robust not that adaptable so they've always been scarce in terms of tag availability hunt availability so they're very expensive and what has happened is that scarcity has kind of promoted this idea that where they're at they're the only species there and they're the only species that are going to take you to that beautiful country it's just not true and just like a short little caveat on that like you can go stone sheep hunting in northern british columbia and it's going to cost you now like 60 70 80 thousand dollars like in that crazy realm but you can hunt other species in that same country you can hunt mountain caribou in those same areas you can hunt big moose in similar areas a little bit lower country but takes you to the same topography there's other hunts you can do some of those areas now even bigger black bear populations are occurring there so you can go up and have a really cool high mountain black bear hunt in the same area that historically people only associate with stone sheep hunting right so that's just an analogous situation but the short of it is is elk hunting is not special in terms of the place it takes you all right got in the fresh air back to the office all right but i gotta talk about something that you can't replicate when it comes to the experience and it comes to elk hunting and that's the elk rut back to what i said before if you've got the money, you got the time, if you got the ability to do it, there's nothing else like calling in bulls and big bulls close up to you and shooting them with a bow, or for that case, just hunting them in the rut with a gun in those rare opportunities that you can do that. That is amazing, and you can't replicate that experience. So if you can do that, do it, and you know that's, that's the magic of elk hunting right there. That is the one thing that truly sets it apart from a lot of these other species. I, there's, I'm gonna talk about one other thing when it comes to elk hunting too, um, that I'm a little hesitant to talk about. I'll talk about it later. It's gonna be very hard for me not to sound like a freaking egomaniac when I talk about it, but there's one other thing too that I think sets elk hunting apart too. But in terms of the experience, very hard to replicate archery elk hunting during the rut. But here's a super big dirty secret, particularly in Colorado. If you are going on one of these hunts, <clears throat> hold on, before I drop this bomb, 
I gotta wet my lips a little bit. If you are going on archery elk hunts in Colorado, and you've been watching videos of elk hunts, you've been watching a bunch of calling videos, you've been watching you know, bulls come in and that's what you're pumped about, you want that experience, you are, how do I put this nicely? I think you misunderstand what the average, you know, what your expectation should be on your first archery hunts in Colorado. Yeah, 10, 15 years ago, when the bull density in wilderness areas and the overall density of elk in wilderness areas was double what it is now, and that's the truth, guys. You can read all the bullshit state stats you want. In all the wildernesses in Colorado right now, the easy to draw stuff, the easy to draw archery tags or the over-the-counter archery tags that still remain, those areas, there is half as many elk as there were 15 years ago. Everybody I know in the business will tell you that that's a fact. We don't have to look at the data. I have enough just anecdotal data from you know my peers in the outfitting space or peers of just do-it-yourself hunters who've spent time in the woods. It's at least half the number of elk in the woods. But I, again, get off track. What I'm talking about here is the amount of vocalizations. There's half as many elk, and the thing about it is one of the biggest correlating, fa or one of the biggest, not correlating, it's more of a causal factor when it comes to elk vocalizations in the field is the density of elk. And it's not linear, right? If you have half as many elk in an area, it's not like there's gonna be half as many vocalizations. There's actually gonna be like a quarter of the amount of vocalizations or a fifth of the amount of vocalizations. And the reason being is elk just don't have to vocalize as much because they don't get into the situations where they're interacting with a lot of other elk. Elk are moving in and out of different groups and clashing, you know, these rut fest deals, that sort of things. That's not happening near as much when the density of elk is much lower. So what you have in most of these areas, like I would say the majority of them is your vocalizations and along with that, your experience of the archery rut elk fest. You like when Rogan talks about it and I love it when he talks about it, you can see his eyes sparkle. Like I've been, I, you know, when I was talking to Joe Rogan, I could see in person, like this is not fake. Like he's been in those rut fests. He's heard those bulls shake his heart, you know, shake him to his soul, right? When they just, you know, they bugle right near you. That is an awesome experience. But what he's talking about is now very, very rare on these easy to draw hunts, these over the counter archery hunts. I think a good expectation for a guy that knows what he's doing, like a guy knows how to call, knows how to glass up elk, knows elk behavior, knows an area, on an archery hunt in this type of unit that's you know six to 10 days long, if he gets those experiences twice during that period of time, that's a long time of hunting hard. If he gets that twice during a hunt now in Colorado units or Idaho units that are easy to draw, he's doing pretty well. So like you know, one fifth of the days, you're gonna have that experience. Somebody who's hitting that is a pretty damn good do-it-yourself elk hunter right now, right? 15 years ago, that would have been like, Anybody could have done that, right? One out of five days, you're gonna get in some elk and it's the rut, they're bugling, but no more. So all of this ties back into this fact that what you're wanting, what distinguishes the elk hunting experience to some extent, there's less of. You gotta take that into account if that is one of the reasons that this hunt differentiates itself from a lot of the other hunts, the alternatives that you could do in the same areas. And that goes right into success rate. So I'm gonna be straight up with you. The state stats on harvest statistics are, they're not bullshit. I mean, they're, they're real data, but the thing about it is you have to kind of know how to read them, right? And to some extent, you have to have idiosyncratic information about specific units to really know what that harvest rate means. But I can tell you overall, just to be short about it, and then I'll give you some details, your rifle hunts in Colorado on over-the-counter stuff, super easy to draw hunts, it's probably, Probably for you guys, like guys going out there, do it yourself in it and learning how to hunt, it's sub 10%. And the reason being is even if they post up a success rate on the state game site of 15% or 20%, you have to realize that if you're new, you're on the bottom half of that, of that, you know, that learning curve. That percentage amount that you're seeing, that includes locals who know every freaking spot in that unit and they're gonna kill one most years. So, right, they bias it heavily because their personal success rate is like 90% or 80%, right? Or maybe it's 70%. But when you're talking about these low percentages, those people bias it. The other thing that biases a lot of those stats, particularly on archery hunts, 
is the private land harvest, right? You have to really look at that, look at that data, look at the stuff that parses out private land, and then sometimes you know you see private land only tags, you'll see that their success rate's higher, and then you'll look at the public tag, and you'll be like, oh well, the public tag is still pretty good. Yeah, but the public tag, a lot of those are still being used on big chunks of private land in the unit. So what you have is again, you have bias there. So Short and sweet on it is rifle hunts for this type of stuff, sub 10%, archery hunts, sub 5%. Less than one in 20 success rate, dead elk in hand, all right? So that's just the reality of this. That's what you're looking at on this type of hunt. The thing is, one hunt in particular I'm gonna talk about bear hunts as an alternative. They actually have the opposite issue when you look at harvest rates. A lot of times, if you look at harvest rates in the data set, they're super low on bears. And the reason, like it could be like some, some units, it's gonna be like 1% or 3%. And the reason is, is the tags are cheap. So what happens is when they just unload a bunch of tags that are cheap in the marketplace of people buying tags for these hunts, everybody buys them, including people that really have no intention of focusing on that species, right? It's just an opportunity tag. You have the same thing in Idaho with wolves or other areas that issue wolf tags. The success rate is super, super, super low. And the reason is that the vast majority of people with that tag, they're not actually wolf hunting, right? They're actually elk hunting and they might just run across a wolf. You see the same thing with lion tags. You see the same thing with opportunity tags. So you have to look at those harvest stats and basically just throw them out. I can tell you that in Colorado for fall bear hunts, if that's what you're focused on, in Idaho, if you're focused on spring bear hunts and you're going to spend five to 10 days doing those type of hunts, I personally think that even you newer guys should go out there. If you push it through a hunt, I think 30, 40, 50% success rate is a reasonable expectation on that type of hunt. But Again, I digress. All right, the big one, meat. The meat of elk. This glorious game meat. All right, so it is good, right? In terms of the hierarchy of game meat, elk is on the top of it for me. Like I got elk and then I got like moose hovering right there and axis deer is kind of circling it. To me, they're all about the same in terms of quality. And that drives a lot of the interest in elk hunting. But again, this has kind of been like over marketed. It's not like elk is that much better than mule deer, it's not like it's that much better than bear. I think if somebody, you know, you took all the bias out of it and you put like all these game meats in front of somebody, like take a non-hunter and you just wanted to do taste tests, they're gonna grossly prefer domestic beef over all the game meat. So don't, don't kid yourself on that. But then the other game meats, they're not gonna be that far apart. And you know, not to like, again, like shit on people's dreams, but in terms of elk, the worst tasting elk meat is big old rutting bulls in the middle of September. And that's where a lot of your guys is interested. Again, it's not bad, but it's kind of compared, like if I had to compare, you know, just your average elk meat to bear meat, let's say, or to mule deer meat, like, yeah, I would much prefer, you know, your average elk meat, right? But if I was comparing, you know, big old ruddy bull that smells like elk piss during the middle of the rut, if I was comparing him to like a fat choke cherry fed, you know, fall black bear, it's gonna be pretty similar. And what I can do with the meat and how I can utilize it, again, it's like pretty similar. I think, I don't, I think we, I think again, there's a lot of propaganda in here that there's just like massive difference. And if I eat elk, it's like superpower, aphrodisiac, big muscles. Like it's the only, it's, it's a bunch of bullshit guys, really what it is. There's really not that much difference. It's still game meat, it's still lean. You still gotta cook it right. And the other thing is like reflecting on my last point is if there's three or four times the chance, right? If, if you go on a mule deer hunt, you know, if you pick it right in one of these states, you have a three or four times greater chance of harvesting an animal over you know the equivalent bull elk hunts so having some game meat is better than not having any game meat kind of regardless of what it is and the same thing goes for bear hunts so anyways that's my spiel on meat again i think it's like uh again it's just propaganda you know elk meat's great but it's not like it's the only game meat and you have to have it all the other meat is healthy good for you has all that stuff too it's lean it's awesome mm. Oh, all this shit talking has got me in a situation where I need to stretch again. So ugh, let's go on a walk. So I'm actually multitasking here and this is not product placement. I've got to sharpen my dive knife. I've been stabbing Barracuda and Wahoo in the head with it. But this thing right here from WorkSharp, this field sharpener. I love this fucking thing so much. I actually reached out to them and I was like, look guys, I, I love this product, this field sharpener. It's amazing. I'm going to do some videos on it. Why don't you guys sponsor me on those? Because I'm already gonna sound like you're paying me, right? So they aren't paying me, but this thing 
is badass. Stay tuned for some future videos on it. We'll talk about it. Oh yeah, we were talking about how elk hunting sucks. No, we weren't, but we were diving in deep, getting, trying to make some right decisions, right? So what I want to talk about, and this is really relevant to my audience, I think, and that's the skill set building part of elk hunting. And on this one, I take a little, uh, on, on this one in particular, I think I take a little fault because I am a big proponent of over-the-counter wilderness hunts, backpack hunts, pack and horse and mule hunts, that type of hunting. To me, that is where hunters are being, you know, forged by the flames of hell, right? In terms of all the guides I've ever had work for me, the best ones out of the box are guys with a background in that type of hunting. And I can tell you, the best hunters from my perspective are long-term wilderness elk hunting guides. And the reason being is there's so many elements of hardship in that type of hunt. And like I said before, that's getting more and more the case as the hunting gets harder. The thing is, if you're forging yourself as a hunter through these over-the-counter, easy-to-draw elk hunts, it puts, you in a, it puts you in a situation where if you deal with the hardship, you deal with the long duration of the hunt, the intense physicality of it, if you're packing out elk quarters on your back, if you're backpack hunting, just the crazy weather that you can deal with even in September, let alone if you're backpack hunting into the rifle seasons, right? All of that, if you can cut your teeth doing that, you will become a phenomenal Western big game hunter across species. And it's, this is not like brain science. This shit's so hard that if you can get good at that one, then the other hunts are easy. I mean, like I go on hunts now sometimes where I'm like, this shit is fun still, but it's so much easier than wall tent based second season rifle season in Colorado's XYZ wilderness unit or whatever, where I've been putting 20 miles on a horse every day just to scratch up a legal bull elk, right? So. You're forged by the fire in these units, and that's a huge plus. So see, this isn't all about talking shit about these elk hunts. But there's kind of a con embedded in there for a lot of people. See, because what I've come to realize is that a lot of people who get really good at Western hunting through elk hunting, they have a lot of time on their hands, and they're willing to dedicate an enormous amount of time to this endeavor, right? But you know, if you're if if you're not one of those people, and I you know I've become I've become more and more reasonable about that, right? Particularly as I've you know dealt with people in my Patreon group and that sort of thing, I've I've come to realize that a lot of people it's not practical for them to go up their learning curve that way. It's not practical for them to go hunt some wilderness area for 15 days or 20 days every September, and for that to be you know how they get good at this endeavor, right? They just can't do that. They got family, they got jobs, whatever. I, I do acknowledge. That and I think I've gotten better at acknowledging that over the years. So I think in that situation, if you're rational about it, look at the other opportunities that you can do, right? Like mule deer hunts, you can do them on a shorter time frame, you can do them on easier logistics, and you're still gonna get up, up some of the learning curve in terms of elk hunting, right? Yes, the best hunters, the best Western hunters cut their teeth on over-the-counter elk hunting. Till the day I die, unless I see something drastically change, I'm gonna thank that because I lived through that and I saw that amongst guides that work for me. But if that's not practical for you, there's actually another rational approach. Like go on a spring bear hunt, you know, go on a fall bear hunt if you're a rifle elk hunter. That way you can go in September. You can get a week in September and then you can go back in November and go elk hunting. And maybe for your work situation, that gives you double time that you can be in the field and therefore you go up the learning curve quicker. The last thing to say on this is that killing stuff does matter if you want to become a better hunter. There is a skill set associated with the harvest, right? If you don't ever harvest anything, I mean, take take the case of uh, of archery elk that I just mentioned, right? One out of twenty years, right now, you're gonna harvest one, right? Maybe as you get you know, as you get better, you know, you might uh, you know you might be harvesting one out of five years, you know, if you really become a badass on on public land, you know, one out of five years you're gonna harvest a bull, so. That's about, that's about enough time to completely forget how to quarter a bull and how to pack it out on your backpack, right? So, you know, doing some bear hunts in there, doing some mule deer hunts in there, you know, or doing those even first before you get into elk hunting and you, you harvest a few animals, that's gonna get you up to speed on quartering the animal, taking care of the meat, keeping it cool, your logistics, wherever you're at in one of these remote areas, like, hey, you know, where do I get ice? How do I keep it cool? How do I process the animal? Or how do I bring it to a processor? How do I deal with that? You know, what does it turn out? How does it turn out 
really how my family prefers to consume that meat, right? Do we want it cut this way? Do we just prefer sausage? All of that. You kind of work all that out. And the only way to do it is to kill animals, right? So again, not that great on the elk hunting front, right? There's a lot of guys that hunt elk every year and they don't even, they really don't even know that skill set, right? They're hunters, but they couldn't quarter an elk to save their life. Like they got to pull up a YouTube video every time they kill one every six years, right? So that's just, you know, something to think about that. Yeah, man, elk hunting is where it's at. If you just want to like power through the skill set and go up the steepest freaking learning curve possible, that's where it's at. But a rational approach to get to the same end point for a lot of people, a lot of people's lifestyle might not be that. It might be completely different than that. You know what's cool about this? Is this ceramic rod right here? I'm gonna make a whole video on this. So don't, I'm not even gonna talk about it. But this ceramic rod, what they've done is they actually put it at a steeper angle. It actually make, I notice it makes it so much better. And this is like a weird shaped knife because it's a dagger shape, you know, for poking, for brain and fish. But that little ceramic rod on this thing, killer. It's like my info commercial that I'm not getting paid for, you know? Thanks, Word Sharp. Okay. So let's talk about alternative hunts. Actually, before we go there, I got to touch on one topic because this is just a reality, guys. A lot of people, the reason that they want to do these elk hunts is a completely ego-driven deal. And I'm not saying that this should be part of the reasoning, but just empirically it is. When I talk to people, they like the idea of a big rack, a big animal, and that signifies to other people whatever, right? If it helps mitigate that for you, right? And I'm just trying to be completely transparent because I know it's a thing and I know people think about it this way. I've sold so many hunts over the year that I tease this out from people when I'm trying to manage expectations. And what I think is very important for you to realize is that if somebody shows me an experienced person in the elk hunting world, a hunting guide, or you know, a lot of other people too, experienced people, hey, you gotta see this bull that so-and-so killed, right? And they'll show me a picture. It could be the biggest bull in the world and it means nothing to me, right? If I wanna judge somebody's skill set, particularly on the elk species, and somebody shows me a picture, it literally has zero value in terms of me assessing their ability. And again, this does not matter to me. I don't give a shit about any of this, but a lot of people do. I just want you to know that do not do elk hunts because of that, right? Even if you go out and kill a giant bull elk, it is probably the worst single signal that you're a great white hunter or an awesome outdoorsman. I gotta know the draw odds. I gotta know if it was off a high fence. I gotta know if it was off a private ranch. I gotta know the wilderness area it was off of. I gotta know how many points it took you. All of that stuff to just vaguely use it as a metric in me judging you as a there hunter. There are other species, honestly, that are much better indicators of how great of a hunter you are. So I'm leaving it with that because this is like a stupid topic to talk about, but I know it factors in for you a lot, a lot of you. So I want you to know that big bull elk, big dead bull elk do not mean jack shit in terms of showing other people that you're a great hunter or not. All right. So the alternative hunts, two big ones in the Western mountains, right? First you have mule deer hunts, mule deer hunts, particularly in Colorado right now, because they're pounding the mule deer and they're going to do that for the next probably decade. There's way too many tags, but you as a hunter, particularly as a newer hunter, where you're not obsessed with the quality of the animal, the trophy quality of the animal, you just want to get some good hunts in, there's a great opportunity there. And I don't mind saying that. People scoff at that, like, Cliff, why are you promoting these hunts when you know the deer are getting overhunted? It's not my place. I don't issue the tags. All the mule deer tags are going to get sold and they're going to get hunted. So I'm not doing mule deer wrong by promoting this. But I can tell you right now, it's a great hunt to get up the learning curve and have a ton, like check off a lot of these things that you think an elk hunt is in a different style of hunt, a different species hunt, right? So on, in terms of the area, the topography, the places it's gonna take you, very similar to elk hunts, particularly if you archery hunt them in September, but even your later hunts, if you've got a second rifle tag for mule deer, a lot of times it's gonna take you into the same elevations as the elk. If you're a tough son of a bitch, you can backpack hunt them so you can get that experience, you can build that skill set. And then, like I mentioned before, it's a cheaper tag. If you wanna hunt them from more accessible areas, you still have a decent chance of harvesting them. There's certain elk hunts that if you go on and you can't get a vehicle down like pretty rough roads and you can't hike a mile and a half off the road, that sort of thing, the chances of you killing elk are almost zero. Mule deer, there are hunts out there that you can draw, you know, you can just get without points as long as you put in for the draw in places where you can hunt them from the road. You can hike, you know, a mile off 
your main drag roads and there's a good chance that if you're patient, you work on your skill set, you learn a little bit about their behavior, how they move around, you can kill a mule deer buck. So those are nice things about that and nice ways to build up the skill set. In terms of the meat deal, yeah, not quite as good as elk. Pre-rut, they're better. Rutting mule deer are not as good. I actually have eaten a ton of mule deer over the years, but a lot of it was during the rut because I, I guide a lot during the late season. Best mule deer I ever had was a roadkill buck. And I'll have to do a whole video on that. It happened on a date night that me and my wife were having. I ended up killing this buck in the parking lot of a restaurant because uh, another vehicle broke its back. I killed it with a knife in the parking lot of the uh, restaurant. And it was like late August, the buck was still in velvet, but the velvet was starting to die a little bit. But that buck was phenomenal. I got I got a legal permit to, to take the roadkill buck, but that buck was phenomenal. So, so what I'll say on that is it does depend, you know, what season you hunt them. If they're rutting, they don't taste as good in my mind, but it's pretty good meat, not quite as good as elk. In terms of glassing, very similar to elk hunting. In terms of stocks, very similar. You've got to learn your wind. You've got to understand how to get through topography quietly, all of that. Those are overlapping skill sets. So mule deer hunts are a great option for you. Easy to draw, higher success rate. Decent tags in Colorado that are going to take you no points to draw are going to be 25, 30% success rate. If you dedicate your time to that, that's what you're going to get. 30, 40% success rate versus the elk alternative. The other alternative I want to talk about is bear hunts. And I'll do some dedicated videos on this. I think it's a way undervalued hunt out west right now. And the reason is, it's just that supply and demand dynamic. A lot of the state game departments have a huge influx in bear populations over the last decade. They're starting to realize that. They're starting to realize the impact on calves and fawns. And so they're wanting to harvest more of those. So they're putting out more tags and those are available. That's actually reflected in the price, which is nice. A lot of times, you know, when there's an increase in tags on species, the price doesn't decrease. A lot of these states in particular are giving non-residents ripping deal on bear tags, 100 bucks, 50 bucks. Some places you can get two tags, right? So those are great opportunities. Now bear, it depends a little bit where you're going in terms of your logistical capabilities in the spring and the fall. You can backpack hunt them if you want to go in somewhere. But a lot of times that's not actually the most proficient way to hunt them. The most proficient way to hunt them is vehicle based, right? Somewhere where you can cover ground and you can check a lot of different areas via glassing, looking for the right type of feed source and then focusing on that and covering area. You know, look into e-bikes, look into, you know, places where you can use a quad side by side, places where you can pack raft across the river and get into some drainages that don't get hunted much. But you can just look at that topography and see that the grass is going to green up there first. Or if it's fall, you know, there's big choke cherry runs or big swath of acres corners it's not getting hunted very much sure there's elk and deer hunters that trounce back in there but they're up high and you can hunt that canyon all alone now on the skill set front your glassing is going to be very similar your stocking is going to be very similar to mule deer and elk hunts the wind is still relevant the reality is bears particularly during these stages of the year that we hunt them they're so focused on feeding they're not near as flighty as mule deer and elk are particularly elk they get the crap hunted out of them. They become so flighty, so in tune with their, you know, evolved mechanisms for staying safe that they are very, very hard to hunt and very unforgiving. Bears are generally more forgiving, particularly when we see them, but you can still build up that skill set while you're hunting them. So those are the two alternative hunts that I suggest. I've got a few videos on those type of hunts on my channel. You can check out this mule deer hunt here. It kind of goes into the strategy that I think most people should implement when you're thinking about Colorado deer hunting, but there's other states you can look into too. I've got a spring bear bear hunting video. I'll stick that up right here, but I'm also going to do like a fall bear hunting video. I've got a video that's quite old right now that goes over the feed sources for all the game animals, including bear, elk, deer, but the bear section of that is pretty useful just because you can identify the plants that in certain areas, you know, particularly in Colorado, particularly in British Columbia, where I had material to talk about. Those are the exact plants that they key in on. Once I get out of the Caribbean here and I'm back up in the mountains and when I'm in the field this spring, for sure, I'll put together some bear specific videos that should be a lot of value for you if you're trying to do those type of hunts. All right, so there it is. I'll leave you with some positive thoughts on elk hunting. Like I've said several times in this video, if you have the means to do it, you have the time, you have the money, don't worry about the fact that it's kind of an inflated priced hunt or you know, however you want to however you want to call it right it's just a little bit overvalued hunt in my view at this point don't worry about this if you have the ability to do it focus on that it is an awesome hunt and for all the shit talking i've said over this video still probably my favorite hunt to do if not a very very close second 
archery elk hunting in particular is going to be always up there it's a great time like i said in the one section of this video it's a great way to cut your teeth it's a great way to just abuse yourself and through that abuse become a phenomenal mountain hunter i think elk hunting will do that for you if you can get into consistent rut action you can't get that in any of these other type of hunts so do that if you can do it it's hard on public land nowadays but there are opportunities if you're just persistent you're private with your spots and you build up a catalog of spots over the years you should get more and more rut activity more and more vocalizations to play with and the last thing i'll say is you can't replicate the pain of an elk pack out these other species are nothing compared to that if you're doing a backpack elk hunt and you do the meat pack out and you do it with good friends those are moments that will be burned into your memory bank because one they suck but two they're a massive accomplishment when you get back to the truck you get back to the trailhead you can't replicate that with every other species so if you need to do some of these other hunts they're a rational way to approach western hunting and getting better at western hunting but eventually knock out that elk goal and experience that magic it's pretty darn awesome i hope you guys like this video if you got value from it please do me a huge favor like it and subscribe to the channel if you disagree with anything in this video which i'm sure there's a bunch that you did please leave a comment below we'll get into it thanks for watching guys i'll catch you later